Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with an absolutely spectacular box of CDs on Naxos devoted to Ned Roram, America's greatest living composer, question mark, arguably, yes, because first of all, he's still living, which you have to be to be a great living composer, obviously. And second of all, he writes fantastic fantastic music. Wonderful, wonderful music. And the Naxos series of Roram, which it actually comprehends more than just these discs. This is the stuff that, that Jose Cerebrier did, and it, which is only a fraction of the stuff that's available. And he really is. I mean, you can get all this stuff on disc. Why aren't people listening to it? What's the problem? People say to me, well, name some great living composers and living American composers or great American composers, whatever they want. And I say, Ned Roram. And they look at me like I'm crazy. I mean, and they look at me like, you know, oh, he's still alive. They, they look at me as though, as though he's supposed to be dead so that they can forget about him. I don't understand that. The guy is terrific. He's characterful. He has a personal style. He has media in which he excels, particularly songs for voice and piano or voice and orchestra. He is a remarkable composer. And the orchestral stuff, which is on most of these discs, is just wonderful. It's absolutely amazing. And if you haven't heard it, then you really need to. Totally need to hear some of this. And we're going to hear some of it. We're going to hear samples because happily it's on Nexus and I can do it. At least I think I can do it. Usually I can do it. Assuming the publisher doesn't come and nail me for a copyright claim. It really fascinates me, actually, you know, that people complain that, well, you don't talk enough about contemporary music. You don't do enough things for living composers. You don't do enough things for the music of today. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a damn good reason because just breathe a word of the music of today, and they all come after you with lawsuits for money, as if they they deserve to be paid for existing. And, and the fact that you're trying to promote them, and uh, with no real benefit financially to yourself, other than the fact that maybe, maybe I'll make two cents from advertising on this video over the next 50 years. I mean, that they want their cut no matter what. It's, it's, it's horrible. I'm hoping this all works out because I have one, two, three, four, five, six, at least six fantastic musical examples I'm going to be playing you. And I'm praying that I get this through. If you're seeing this video, it means that quite likely I have, or that there's only been a remedial type copyright claim that I can probably get removed with a little bit of luck. It's nuts. But let's talk about Ned Warham. Why is it, aside from the fact that he hasn't had the good grace to pass on, why is it that people don't think about him? First of all, his music is not widely played. At least his symphonies aren't. He wrote three of them. Second of all, he's not really a symphonist, although he's written a lot of marvelous orchestral music, particularly concertos and then other non-symphonic pieces. They're really, really good. Uh, but... You know, you, you get cred these days to be like Bruckner. You know, you got to be a symphonist. You got to write big, fat, ambitious, bombastic, pompous, long winded German symphony things. And then you get cred. And then Roram was not like that. Roram's aesthetic is French. And if you love French music the way I love French music, you're going to recognize and love Roram. It's not that he sounds particularly like those people, although there are obvious echoes of Ravel and Poulenc and, and you know, composers like that. But he's French in this, this general sense in his music of, of lightness, of, of that wonderfully, wonderfully witty quality that French composers always seem to have, even when they're being serious, they manage to do it in his, is his lack of concern for the formal strictures of, of German contrapuntal writing, for his love of melody, for his love of beautiful sounds and crisp, clear orchestration. All of those things evoke the French music that Roram unabashedly adores which doesn't mean that he doesn't sound like himself. He sounds often recognizably like an American composer of a certain French bent. 
And I think it's just it's just marvelous. You have to appreciate it for what it is. And what it is is pretty damn splendid, quite frankly. The other reason I think he's he's been sort of ignored or at least you know, I, I think the word is uh, nodded at, you know, in passing with a knowing smile, is that he's at least as famous as a diarist and writer as he is a composer. In fact, he is probably the the best writer composer since Wagner. And I say that, I mean, there have been quite a few, but he really, really writes well. And his writings are very, very interesting and often quite provocative. And he has always been unashamed uh, in talking about his being homosexual and being gay, which, you know, you would think it's the performing arts and there's always nod, nod, wink, wink. Everybody's gay. Everybody knows it. Nobody cares. Well, yes and no. It's sort of like it's easier to understand what the attitude really is, I think, if you think of female pianists. Try and be an overweight, unattractive female who looks terrible in a strapless dress and see if you're going to have a concert career these days, even if you're the greatest pianist in the world. It won't make any difference because it's, it's, it's just the way these things work. There is a, a, a constant and, and general sexism, racism, homophobia, but it manifests itself in its own delightful way that's unique to the performing arts. And one of those delightful ways, in my view, is that composers like Ned Roram, who have never made any any sort of sort of uh, concessions to who they are and have always been perfectly comfortable and fine with it, are treated with a certain uh, level of what I would consider to be uh, disrespect, or they're taken for granted and not given, I think, the attention that they deserve. Roram's music deserves to be played. It deserves to be heard. It's tremendous, period. So let's talk about it, shall we? There are, in this, in this collection here, which, by the way, I got it on Amazon, and I can't make a promise that this is still true, but I got it on Amazon for less than $13, five discs. It sells for like $49.95 normally or something like that. But the price on Amazon was insane. So if you see it, grab it. Grab it quickly. I, I, last time I checked, there were like two copies left. But I don't know. They may get more. That's what they were selling it for. And I could not believe it. But in one way or another, I mean, it's really four discs of music. Disc five is one of those conversation things. It's a conversation with Raymond Bishop who is a Naxos person and a really nice guy. And he's talking to uh, Jose Cerebriere and Ned Roram. And it's all about, well, you know, it's just all about themselves. <laughs> I think it's interesting to hear once. I have no desire to listen to it more than once, but that's how I feel about almost all of these conversations. I would so much rather listen to the music than listen to these people talking about themselves. I would rather hear them compose themselves in the music. That's what's fascinating to me. So, disc one, which is a knockout, it features um, Jose Cerebriere and the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra doing the three symphonies. And Roram's three symphonies came as really a shock because the third was quasi well known because Bernstein recorded it with the, with the New York Philharmonic. It was in one of those live, live boxes. God, it deserves to be played. I mean, it should just be a repertory piece. I find it so much more appealing than other American symphonies that that get played regularly by like Piston and Harris and and you know William Schumann and those guys. Not that those are bad. They're lovely, but boy, this is just as good and it's wonderful. Anyway, but the first and the second were the real surprises because they are good pieces. What they are, however, also is somewhat more anonymous. I mean, you know, Roram hadn't quite found his most personal idiom at the time that he wrote them, but that doesn't mean they aren't absolutely terrific. You could say the same thing about Elliot Carter's first symphony, which is arguably one of the nicest pieces he ever wrote, or most listenable ones, certainly, and it's certainly not in his mature style. So, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't make anything out of that. But I'm going to play you, let me play you a bit. I'll take this thing out here, and I just want to play you a little sample of the finale of the first symphony, because what, what I want you to listen to is just this beautiful melody 
that pops up in the finale. You know, the thing about Roram is that even though his music in the quick music can sound very Americanish, you know, that, you know, syncopated rhythms and crackly percussion and that sort of neoclassical um, element, and which is also, by the way, totally French, because all of those American composers studied in Paris with Nadia Boulanger, and they all wound, wound up writing like Roussel and those guys, you know. So yes, he's of that school, but there's there's a melodic lyricism and sweetness in his music, which is absolutely personal, and you hear it right away in the very first symphony. And here's a bit of it from the finale. Take a listen. I think that speaks for itself. Uh, who sounds like that? I don't think anybody else does. And the third symphony, which is you know his symphonic masterpieces in five movements, actually, and they are they're marked. Let me just tell you what they are. It gives you a sense of how it operates. Passacaglia, and then Allegro molto vivace, largo andante, and Allegro molto. In other words, there's a certain baroque sweet element to this to this piece with the Passacaglia first. I mean, of course, there's a certain Baroque sweet element to Brahms fourth with the Passacaglia last. But yes, you, you, you get that sense a little bit. And, and you'll find that the sweet type construction is what is going to characterize much of his larger orchestral works going forward, which we will discuss momentarily, the concertos and some other things. But listen to the opening of the third movement. Um, the third movement, I'm sorry, the finale of the third symphony. It's just wonderful music. Wonderful, breezy, insouciant. That's the word, it's French. Insouciant music. Here it is. Okay, if those don't sell you, then nothing's gonna. I mean, that's that's just the reality of the situation. It's it's wonderful stuff, absolutely wonderful stuff. So uh, I'm gonna put this away, and we're gonna go on right away to disc two, which contains a couple absolutely splendid concertos. Hang on a minute. Of course, I can't get this little tray up. Oh, there we go. I think I got it. Yes, we have it, uh, more or less. There we go. Okay, it's my fault, folks. I'm not prepared. There we are. Okay, done. Let's get rid of this thing. Okay, so we're now we're on disc number two, where we get, I don't have to take the thing out, Piano Concerto number two and the Cello Concerto. Now, the Piano Concerto number two is an earlier work. It's contemporary with the first couple of symphonies, 1951. And it's a normal symphony in three, a symphony concerto in three standard concerto movements. And they're marked somber and steady, quiet and sad, and then real fast, exclamation point. And you really get a sense that he's starting to find his, his way personally um, in this particular concerto. It's a wonderful concerto. It's a big one. It's more than half an hour long, 34 minutes, this performance. with uh, This is with the Royal Scottish National Orchestra, Jose Cerebrier. And the soloists are Simon Mulligan in the piano concerto and, and um, Wen Xin Yang in the cello concerto. And they're wonderful performers. But what makes this piano concerto so much fun is that it's it's just so ebullient. It's so full of gusto. And it's just a totally confident essay in over-the-top piano writing. 
So if you like, say, Prokofiev second or one of those pieces, you're going to love this concerto. It's, it's oodles of fun. Here's a bit of the finale, real fast, exclamation point. Now, the cello concerto dates from 2002, and it's one of those sweet type pieces. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight movements. They are marked, you ready? Curtain raise, there and back, three queries, one response, competitive chaos. It sounds like fun, doesn't it? A single tune, a dozen implications, one coin, two sides, vols, rappelé and adrift. And those are the movements. Now, I often think some of these titles are, are just an effort to be coy. You know, they, they raise more questions than they answer. But as I said when I reviewed this disc originally, if that gets you to listen, then it's, you know, more power to them. You know, it really all depends on, on how the titles interact with the actual music. And the music itself has to be utterly captivating to justify it having a title, which in this case it does. Otherwise, the titles are more interesting than the musical results, which is always annoying and very frequently happens in these days in contemporary music. But it doesn't happen with Roram because the music is always interesting. And I want to play you a good bit of the Valls Rappelé, a very witty contest between the orchestra and the solo cello in what purports to be three-quarter time. Here you go. It's fun. It has it has humor. It has character. It it, it, it grabs you. I, it's wonderful. And it doesn't have to be anodyne. And it doesn't have to. He's not dumbing the music down. He's not treating his audience like a bunch of morons. It's just very very characterful, listenable music. It's wonderful. All right, disc number three in this series contains his flute concerto and the violin concerto. Now, both of these works are later works. The violin concerto is 1985, and the flute concerto is 2002, and they're prefaced by a work for string orchestra called Pilgrims, which is quite lovely. But what I want to talk about is the flute concerto particularly. The violin concerto is another one of those sweet piece, sweet type pieces. Actually, both of them are. The movements in the violin concerto are Twilight, Takata Chacon, there we go, another Baroque thingy, Romance Without Words, Midnight, Takata Rondo, and Dawn is the finale. And if you know your Daphnis and Chloe suite number two, you will be very interested in hearing how Roram does Dawn. Anyway, the flute concerto has one, two, three, four, five, six movements. They are the stone tower, leaving, traveling, traveling, hoping, and then sirens, him, fake waltz, and finally, oh, it's false waltz, pardon me, and then a re resume and prayer. To conclude, I want to play you a bit of sirens, sirens, just 
beautiful writing for the flute and some very evocative orchestration. Here it is. lovely. It really makes you want to hear the whole work, doesn't it? I mean, it's evocative. Anyway, the flutist there was the dedicatee, Jeffrey Connor. Um, and let's see, the violinist of the violin concerto is Philippe Quint. And this is the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra under Jose Cerebriere. And that does it for the three discs of orchestral music in this box, which you can get singly. And I just, I recommend them all very, very strongly. They're just wonderful. Um, and then there is another disc, a, lastly, a disc of selected songs, a lot of them. There's, there's, oh my God, how many are there on here? 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 32 songs. Now, everyone agrees that Roram is a master songwriter. And the art song, of course, is one of those controversial musical musical media in the classical world because of course art songs are art songs and they try very 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 hard not to be pop songs and the composers who write them best are the ones who aren't conscious of their artfulness they just write good songs and Roram has written very very many very many good songs and the way I first you know, heard some of his songs was as sung by, by Phyllis Curtin, the great American soprano, um, who I knew because I went to high school with her daughter. And she was giving master classes to our glee club. And she was at Yale teaching there and she was sort of around. And so, and she was one of the great Roram interpreters. And she always included some of his songs whenever she gave us one of her, her classes in the art of singing. And it was really wonderful because that's how, that's how you, you hear living composers quite often. So these songs are sung by, by Carol Farley and Ned Roram himself is the pianist. Now, my partner at ClassicsToday.com, David Vernier, did not like this disc because he did not like the way Carol Farley interpreted. He found her somewhat Elizabeth Schwartzkopfian, a little bit heavy handed, a little bit exaggerated in her delivery of the text. And he also thought that the way he leaned, she leaned on, the way that she leaned on certain notes, you know, at the beginnings of phrases and whatnot was kind of mannered. And actually he's right. She does do that. And it sort of it is perhaps a bit affected or a, a, a mannerism, almost like a little nervous tick, but the voice itself sounds okay, sounds good. And there's no question that she's into these things. And Roram's piano playing is marvelous. And so, you know, you can hear and judge for yourself. It's, you know, judging, you know, the quality of singers is always a major, 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 major uh, issue of personal taste. And the song we're going to hear, the whole song, which is about 44 seconds long, is called, I have to find this thing, it's called Sally's Smile. And I have to try and get it into the light here so I can read it. There we go. Here's the text because that's no normal with songs, especially once in English. You can't understand a word they're singing. Not, you know, and it, and it matters. And fortunately, you do get the words with this disc, which is a wonderful thing. Here we go. It's called Sally Smile. Uh, Sarah has smiled upon me such a smile that caution and impatience, both my, both my wardens, let's see, oh, poetry is so hard, are flung into the winds that, that, uh, let's see, that mile on mile, uh, pour un, pour northward from the Miami gardens. There, I got one stanza through. Here we go. And the next one is, 
the Miami Gardens. Oh, here, look, it's juicy. Where my dead mother lies and red the rose and the hibiscus bloom. But there is no fancy to me more fair and dear in those distances than the presence of Sally O. Now, the, the actual poem is by, who's it by here? Wait a minute, let's find out. Oh, Paul Goodman. I have no idea what he's talking about. Um, absolutely none, but it's very poetic. And the setting is what makes it so interesting. I love Roram's setting because it gives the whole text, which may or not be, may not be comprehensible, a wonderful slant by making a rather jocose and jolly setting out of it. Here it is. upon me such a smile that caution and impatience both my wardens are thrown into the winds that my love I pour not from the Miami gardens where my dead mother lies and red the rose and the hibiscus bloom but there is no fancy to me more fair and dear in this it makes you think. It makes you think about the relationship between the words and the music and what's really going on. And that, to me, anyway, is the mark of a very fine songwriter. Never mind the fact that it's fun to listen to and it sounds like he's having a good time playing it and Carol Farley, whether you like her or not, seems to be having a very good time singing it. Anyway, that is The Art of Sound, which this box is called for some reason I don't understand. Um, wonderful performances, great music, a spellbindingly fine composer who deserves all the attention that we can give him because he's serious and he's meaningful and he's still with us and he deserves to enjoy and savor a measure of success before he joins his great compatriots in the permanent beyond conservatorium of musical geniuses. Roram is great stuff. Give him a shot. Please give him a shot and keep on listening. Thank you, friends. Take care.